It's another absurd day in the world of Magic the Gathering. We have an absolute fiasco with the brand new Secret Lair Super Drop. On top of that, the dude in charge of Hasbro has been making insane statements about Magic the Gathering. And if that wasn't enough, Wizards of the Coast just admitted that Thunder Junction is a confusing mess. Now I hope this is recording, cause I can't see anything with these on. Magic. I am a wizard! History. I'm an old wizard! The Magic Historian. My bones hurt. Greetings! Owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles, my friends. I hope the day finds you well because we have gathered for the Eclipse edition of Mega Magic News. Now I actually have to take these Eclipse glasses off because they work really well. You can't see through them at all. I'm going to use them for the Eclipse a little bit later. This is actually being filmed during the two hour window of the Eclipse because I found that to be super enjoyable. Now we have a bunch to discuss today. The Secret Layer Super Drop that they're doing has a number of issues along with it. The CEO of Hasbro has said the most brain damaged things that I've seen in a long time. And Mark Rosewater has come out and admitted just how much of a mess Thunder Junction is. Now before we dive into that, just want to let you know, if you love old school magic lore, the first installment of the Rise of Phyrexia and Yawgmoth has been released over on my Fantasy Geographic channel where I cover magic lore and people are loving it. So I'm going to leave a link at the end of the video in case you want to check that out. Let's dive in to the news. You know what? Let's start out with the secret layer super drop. Now, I already covered the first three secret layers that were all fallout in my previous video. So if you want to know what's going on with those and see them in depth, you can check that out over there. We're going to just take a look at the other three non-universe beyond secret layers. And actually, I just want to take a moment to say this is one of the troubling aspects of this super drop. It is 50% monopolized by universes beyond. And this is a problem going further into magic where we're getting away from what made magic magic and getting more into just slap dashing everything into the game. And actually Hasbro's CEO comments will somewhat tie into that too. But putting aside the universe beyond, let's take a look at the other secret drop offerings because some of them are actually kind of neat. So the first one you're going to see up on the screen is Diabolical Dioramas. And this is actually my favorite of all the secret layer drops that are being released in this super drop. This one actually features full on dioramas that were made and then a picture was taken of them. So you get a really deep kind of cool flavor going on with it. And on top of that, one of the cards has a pretty dark vibe to it as well. So in this you get Fiend Artisan, Carador Ghost Chieftain, Aura Shards, and Gravebreaker Lamia. And the Gravebreaker Lamia has somebody with a sword jammed through them. That's pretty crazy. And it's an interesting contrast to the fact that these essentially look like they're made up using toys, right? But instead, you've got the actual magic artwork taken from it, and it's got that dark aspect to it. Also, interestingly enough, it seems like secret layers are moving more into the commanderfication of magic as well. Because if you take a look at the cards that are included in this particular secret layer, you see they would all slot into the same deck. It's basically like a build a commander decks, doing it by uh, paint by number style, almost. Obviously with just four cards, it's not an entire commander deck, but you get the idea that I'm bringing here. So the next one we have to look at is Artist Series Rovina Kai. Now this one has Inala Archmage Ritualist, Aether Vial, Arcane Signet, and Sword of the Animist. And while the art for this is interesting, it falls into one of the categories of cards I'm not as huge a fan of. It's okay because it's secret layers, so it's not like in the regular Markov Manor set where we had this going on, but these make all the cards look like they're white cards. And the less information that's transmitted when you look at a card, the worse off it is, as far as I'm concerned, because magic can be a very confusing board state in the middle of a game, right? So you look at it and go, oh, I can't even tell what's what. Is that a white card? They're all white cards, but not really. So that is a minor nitpick overall. 
After that, we've got featuring Phoebe Wall. This one has Swords to Plowshares, Fairy Artisans, Dockside Chef, Door of Destinies, and Alayla Artful Provocateur. This one I really enjoyed the artwork for. Also, it was kind of funny to watch people get so excited and go, whoa, whoa, I saw the word Dockside. Oh, chef, come on, man. I'm getting Dockside teased here, bro. So ultimately, the cards in this may not be the most exciting, but I really like the art style, especially on the fairy artisans where you can see them making that little gargoyle creature. He's just sitting there a little, little bit off the top. I don't know. I just dig the overall vibe of it. So when it comes to secret layers, I definitely like these a lot more than the other ones that we're seeing for universes beyond. But there are some issues with this secret layer, which are hilarious. And actually the issues with the secret layer are causing some crazy rumor mongering to go on as well. So the secret layer is called the Equinox secret layer but they're putting it out on the day of the eclipse, which is very, very baffling because you have to understand that the equinox itself already happened. It happened last month, right? So we're like, wait a minute, we've already had the spring equinox and it was weeks ago. And this set is like, I mean, when you look at the symbol for the set, it's half sun, it's half moon. They advertise it saying, okay, this is to celebrate when the day is half foil and half non-foil. But then they put it out on the day of the eclipse it's specifically timed for the day of the eclipse and you go wait wizards doesn't know what equinoxes are do they but that's okay because there's never been any magic cards that feature an equinox wait what there's a card called equinox no shut up really oh wait oh wait no sorry there's a card called vernal equinox oh my bad so they literally have magic cards named after the equinox they don't know when it's happening to add to the confusion they just released the article today talking about the super drop on the day of the actual eclipse, but it's dated for the 5th. So this article was supposed to come out on April 5th instead, and we've got it delayed. And so what's happened is this is causing people to think that this might be connected to the art theft situation where basically we had the whole Faye Dalton, I stole five different bits of art and slammed it onto one card. And more of that stuff is being uncovered, right? Nobody's, re I don't think anybody's compiled the list that every single card she's worked on has stolen elements, but at least half of them do already. So people love conspiracies and they go, wait a minute, Wizards didn't release this weeks ago when they should have. And you've got this date for the release, which I think they changed it to this, but then changed it again. People are thinking that behind the scenes, they had an entire Faye Dalton secret layer or a secret layer that featured at least one piece of Faye Dalton's artwork. Most of the time, it feels like the secret layers are just done by one artist. So if that theory was going to hold true, then it probably would be like an artist series, Faye Dalton. And that would have been incredible if it was the case. Now, when you look at the evidence, it's pretty shaky. It's just a bunch of people going, here's what I feel has happened. And Wizards has screwed up with the Equinox drop and put it out on the Eclipse. So it's entirely possible that a number of different things happened. They originally were marketing this for an Equinox and went, we need something to say the secret layer is about. Well, we'll just say it's about the Equinox. Who cares? We do Valentine's Day once. We just need a day. And then somebody in marketing went, nobody cares about Equinoxes, but the Eclipse is coming up. Why don't we just shove it to the eclipse date? Because the marketing people don't really care what anybody else at the company has to say. And we'll get into that a little bit later because that comes up with the crazy, the crazy stuff they were saying about Thunder Junction. But either way, it might turn out the marketing department just went, just put it out on the eclipse. We'll we'll piggyback on what's going down with the eclipse. And speaking of which, I gotta make sure I wrap this video up in a timely fashion because otherwise I'm gonna miss the full eclipse. We're in the actual path of totality. So I get to see the whole thing. But anyways, back to the Faye Dalton situation. When you take a look at the art numbers, uh, not the artist numbers, sorry, the collector numbers at the bottom of these secret layer cards, they're almost all sequential. There is a big gap between the two Fallout ones. So it's possible that there was a Faye Dalton secret layer somewhere in there, but to me, it's improbable. All of the secret layers that we're seeing are numerically sequenced after the Fallout ones. So the Fallout ones have a gap in between them for collector numbers, between like two of them. But when it comes to the actual secret layers that are brand new and aren't the Fallout universe beyond ones, they all follow a sequence after the Fallout stuff, 
with no gap. So that gives a, I mean, technically, technically there could be another secret layer in there, but as far as I'm concerned, this is baseless speculation and it mostly just adds up to Wizards of the Coast being inept and then trying to piggyback onto the Eclipse and just going, well, this will be more marketable. They're actually tweeting out, hey, remember not to look directly at the sun and people are just roasting them in the comments. Oh, your prices blind me worse. It's harder to look at your cards and read them than it is to see an Eclipse. It's just, it's just a bunch of pushback. But anyways, that covers everything that I wanted to talk about in regards to the secret layer. So let's move on to talking about Thunder Junction and then we'll end it off with the CEO insanity and what he had to say. So when it comes to Thunder Junction, Mark Rosewater just put out an article where it talks about the underlying design concepts for Thunder Junction and what they were trying to accomplish. And after reading it, I was very dismayed about the direction that Magic the Gathering is going because things are even worse internally than I thought they would be. So Thunder Junction is what's known as a showcase set. We have a whole bunch of new set types coming. We've got show case the death ray set that's coming up is going to be a travelogue set which is these are disheartening terms because it means that the fundamental nature of magic set design is being turned into these gimmick nonsense concepts so this the showcase concept is supposed to be an inner planar theme set now i want you to think to yourself what is the theme of thunder junction what is it supposed to be now if you thought western Wrong! That's not what it's supposed to be. The theme of Thunder Junction is supposed to be you're a villain with a very minor Western theme. That's the way that Rosewater explained it. And so he went and said that they focused on Western, like the Western concept for the look and feel, but not for marketing and gameplay. So it's supposed to look like a Western, feel like a Western, but not feel Western when you play it and not feel Western when they market it, which is just the, like, I don't even know how to accept that overall. It makes literally no sense where you go, wait, so the overall feeling of it is supposed to be a Western, but you're supposed to feel like a villain and that the Western thing is a set, like, for real, look at the set. It's got a billion dudes in cowboy hats and a bunch of random cameos from a ton of different characters. It's disparate nonsense. There's like 50 legendaries in the set. We're supposed to think it's a villainous set first? Explain Bonnie Paul then. I didn't know that Paul Bunyan was some gigantic villain. You did a lady version of Paul Bunyan and you've got the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote and all kinds of other stuff shoved in there. Like, how are you supposed to think this is a villain set first? Of course marketing is going to go ahead and go, yeah, we're going to market heavily on the Western because that's the clearest thing. This set, like he talked about how there's these prickly points they were really worried about avoiding and how proud they were of how they handled it where it's like we hired cultural consultants to deal with the indigenous issue and so we had indigenous people made but then we decided to have them come from a plane offside of Thunder Junction so they're not actually indigenous people. Why did you hire cultural consultants to make people who aren't indigenous to the plane to be your indigenous to like, it's so disparate and insane with the way that they executed this. It doesn't feel like you get to be a villain. The whole crime concept is touted as, this is amazing design where we've tied everything together now and all this previous stuff you do feels like it's a crime. And it's like, oh yeah, so putting a plus one, plus one counter on one of my opponent's creatures or somebody else's creatures, that's a crime. Giving somebody else life, that's a crime. It's got such amazing, beautiful flavor that resonates through all of magic. It's so ridiculous. And on top of that, reading through it all, you realize that, wait a minute, wait a minute, this wasn't designed for standard? When you read the design notes, it's incredibly important that the set specifically reaches into commander and modern. Remember before fire design was like, yo, we want our standard sets to be exciting, have all these different aspects, and we'd also like to have it reach into these other formats. We'd like to have it go into all kinds of different formats. Well, now that's been thrown to the side, and Commander and Modern are the two things. Milk the Modern players for expensive singles and keep cramming Commander down the casual's throats. So if you wondered why Thunder Junction just feels like a whole bunch of, why is this a Commander Master style set? everybody's here and they introduce new 
villains? We're supposed to think it's all about villains when you've got Eartha Joe. Eartha Joe, the clearly core Zendikari who's climbing a cliff. And they're like, uh, she's a villain. Okay, can you tell me how? Look in the background. There's a little guy climbing behind her. Okay. He's got a cowboy hat on. Okay, that makes her a villain. How? Well, she makes a mercenary token. And anybody who makes a mercenary token automatically is a villainous person. Don't you feel the flavor? Isn't it obvious? So it's just, it's insane. They've reached the point where it's completely a disparate mess. Even like, we're only getting almost half the standard sets we used to when they went, oh, we're bringing Universe Beyond for two of the main sets every year. But don't worry, the other four main sets will be like in-world and Rosewater's going, don't worry, we got lots of in-world sets. But they're just theme sets with nothing tied together to the point where the people designing the sets can't even get the themes that they want to cross. And it, you look at it and go, how did you think that anybody was going to think, wow, I'm the villain. Do you think that plotting really feels like villainous plots when you're just plotting a beaver who wears a saddle or some stupid goat or something? Like, the, the it's all random crap. And trying to pretend that it's tied together is absolutely bonkers, man. Like, I can't, I can't believe that he literally said, like, the thing is, we had to, we were capturing capturing villainy with a little bit of a western feel but also admits that the villain concept is weak for individual card design so it's like the overall set's flavor was supposed to be it's villainous yeah we know individually the cards are weak for transmitting the concept of villain but overall the set does a great job of it but for some reason the marketing department went yeehaw pew, pew, pew. like that wasn't screamingly obvious everybody on earth has a cowboy hat painted onto them and they gave no excuse at all as to why they're dressed up like that. Why does everybody come to an empty plane, forego the clothing they wear, and slap on dusters and hats? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And so, like, this is a showcase set, and if you guys like it, there's infinite possibilities for these. They've got the travelogue set, where that's what they're calling sets where they're going from plane to plane to plane because everything's like the omen pass let us bring everybody to one place that's a showcase theme set that's loose garbage also a travelogue set what will that be it's going to be a theme set that's loose garbage but we like the we don't understand why pl players didn't get the entire point of this set was traveling on a journey and exploring multiple planes they were just caught up on all the traffic lights and monster trucks and gas stations we put in the set Beep, beep, gridlock. Why are you not taking this as the epic traveling across the multiverse travelogue set? Why are you thinking this just has to do with cars and the and the race? Oh, I feel like I'm living in insane world, right? So, let's finish off with the insanity that the, the, the CEO of Hasbro has tossed into the mix. Where he's talking in an interview with NPR. They're like, so... There's been issues with Magic overproducing products. And he's like, yeah, but just listen, listen, sure. Bank of America downgraded us and said that we were making too much and that nobody should have anything to do with us. But then we made some changes and they barely upgraded us to a kind of buy now. Oh, all right. Wow, we did it, guys. There's no addressing of the fact that there's any overproduction whatsoever and he's, he he keeps using language like i think this is what's going on i think a hundred years from now hasbro's ceo that's celebrating their next hundredth anniversary will be talking about how successful our push for toys have been and how every kid will be playing with our toys and it's like you're out of your mind you guys are falling apart you're oh we're gonna be leaders in toys you are holding on to magic for dear life going you're the only way we can get money but yeah you know what we're ballers at the toys and so it gets crazier when he starts talking about how great magic is doing we have more magic players than ever they're happier than ever the cards are better than ever and guess what there's 10,000 local game stores and they are the major place where people go to buy our products they are very very happy and they're making more money than ever they're more successful than ever they're doing better than ever that is the message that he is trying to put out to the public when lgs is are folding left, right, and center. Markov Manor is still Markdown Manor, full clearance. I can see it on sale below store cost in a number of locations to this day. And Thunder Junction is just on the horizon and it's going to get the same reception. Thunder Junction has literally had a massive pullback from game stores 
and distributors to the point where Wizards is trying to hold the Modern Horizon Collector decks hostage to four stores to run Thunder Junction events to try and goose the numbers. That's it. They're playing allocation devil to go, you got to buy Thunder Junction. And it's going to have the same situation where Thunder Junction's going to have to get marked down to move out the door. People aren't going to pay these insane prices. Wizards decided to jack the prices on their products by 30% at the same time they reduced effort on their sets by 80%. So you've just got this insane mishmash where it's just going to get worse for game stores going forward. And he's all like, I think everything's going to be awesome for the next 100 years. 100 years of Asmo! 100 years of magic! Every game store is thriving! No, no, no. You're destroying them by undercutting them through Amazon. You're giving them terrible deals to the point where distributors know your product is poison. Magic the Gathering is on a massive downswing and people are just pointing at recent sales of things like Lord of the Rings going better than ever, better than ever. But that's not the underlying reality. Magic the Gathering is in a very rough spot and it's just gonna get worse looking from the design of things. So that being said, I'm all done here. I gotta make sure I go and check out the full on Eclipse. Hopefully it won't be too overcast. Thanks for coming by my friends. I'll be doing a live stream tonight over on my other channel, Hatcher. And if you ever miss any of the live streams, I have a channel called Hatcher Streams where I archive all of them so you can check them out there. Big shout out to my patrons. Thank you very much for supporting my channel. And I will see you all my friends in the next video or tonight's stream.